على الكتاب والسنة واتباع السلف الصالح. We are close now to the month of Ramadan, and this blessed month of Ramadan will arrive in five, six, seven days, and before we know it, we will be entering into a mawsum, a a time of the year which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has um, specified for Muslims, specified for us or made for us to renew our iman, to seek repentance, to earn great rewards, and to get closer to Him. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in the Quran, "Shah Ramadan, al-ladhi unzil fihi al-Quran, huda min nasi wa bayyinati bil huda wal furqan." That this month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed in a guidance, a furqan, a criterion for mankind to to see, to judge, to to get guidance from. So, from us, there's for us Muslims, there is a very strong relationship between the Quran and Ramadan. Many of the Muslims these days, they have the Quran, but they don't open it. They leave it on the shelf. They leave it in their bags. They carry it with them everywhere, but they don't read it. They perhaps leave it in their rooms. They say they're going to read it. They're going to read it, but it just the dunya keeps them so busy. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala every year made this month of Ramadan come round to remind us about our relationship to the Quran and that we have to now open that book and we have to read that book. So today I chose a few verses in the Quran. From this book of guidance, which I'm hoping to explain and expand on, to help us to prepare ourselves for this coming month of uh, of Ramadan, and so we can maximize the benefits from this. We have to look at the condition of our hearts, my brothers. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He said in the Quran, "Ya iwan nas, kajakum mawaidatun min darabikum, wa shifaun di ma fi sudur." And this is one of the many noble verses in the Quran, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala addresses the whole of mankind, not just Muslims, the whole of mankind, and He says, "O oh people, indeed has come to you a warning, a mawida, a warning from your Lord, from Allah." And then He says, straight after that, "Wa shifaun lima fi sudur." And also a cure for that which is in the hearts, the breasts. So there's a warning and there's a cure. There's, danger, there's a warning of danger ahead in this book, and also the solutions to your problems. Wahudan wa rahmatan lil mu'minin. And then he also goes further to say in this Quran is hudan guidance. And all mankind are in loss except those who Allah guides. In this book is the hudan and rahma and mercy from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But this hudan and rahma is for none else but the believers, lil mu'minin. So if you notice in the beginning of the verse, Allah is addressing all mankind, all people, Muslims, non-Muslims, believers, unbelievers, and He said. A warning has come to them, to, to to these type of people for all for all of mankind. A warning and also a solution to the problems of your life. This is for all people. And then he speci- specifies for the believers a rahma and a guidance, because guidance are only for those people who actually believe what they're reading. They read it and, and they're moved by this. So this is about the book, the Quran. <coughs> And I'm hoping this verse is something which will make us open it tonight and start reading it page by page by page. Inshallah. In another ayah of the Quran, Allah said that أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى. Indeed, he has succeeded. The one who has purified himself, the one who has cleansed himself from sin, from disobedience, and sought to get closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And the one who mentions his Lord and prays. So, who is success- successful? Indeed, he is successful. Who? Number one, the one who purifies himself from his sins, his misdeeds. You know, he's distant from Allah. He draws closer to Allah. And the one who remembers Allah, makes dhikr of Allah, and the one who prays. These are the ones who were successful. Ramadan is a month 
of which we are striving to become successful, to be of those successful ones. So purifying our nafs, our soul, from all the ailment, the illnesses, that, and the disease that is built up over the years, over the months rather, maybe in some cases over the years, this now is the time to purify ourselves, our souls, and draw closer to Allah. Because the fact of the matter is, my brothers, is everyone here, we came here to listen to this lecture because we believe that we, we need something, we need guidance, we need you know, um, Allah's mercy, we know we're going to return to Allah, we know we're going to die, we're going to die and Allah's going to resurrect us. And what are we going to say to Him? So we need knowledge, and we need to implement that knowledge in our lives and change our lives, that's why we've come here. So we have that belief in the first place. But we've ca- we're, we're carrying our baggage. We've come here carrying baggage of sins, disobedience. We've come here carrying baggage you know, of oppression and whatnot. The month of Ramadan is a glad tiding for that person. And the lucky one who Allah has be- blessed and chosen will be the one who makes a firm intention to purify himself, seek repentance, change his ways, and return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said in the Quran, Ya ayyuha nasu Ya ayyuha ladina amu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuhan O you who believe, and he's addressing the believers, repent to Allah sincerely. The ulama mufassirin said that this ayah is what indicates repentance is an obligation. We don't wait, wait for Ramadan to come and then repent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the, authentic, in, in the Hadith Qudsi that, O oh slave, O oh, oh my servant, you sin by day and I forgive by night. You sin by night and I forgive by day. This is your Lord, this is your Creator. So we don't want to wait for Ramadan for repentance. We want to go into Ramadan ready prepared with, our sin, with, with the istighfar for our sins. And each one of us in this room knows our sins and our disobedience. There's nobody here that is free from sin. Impossible. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you were a qawm, a people who did not sin, then Allah would wipe you out and create those who do sin so He can forgive them. He is Al Ghafur, Al Rahman, Al Rahim. How can who is he going to forgive if they were believers if he created his creation who didn't sin? But that's not a green light to sin, as you know. That doesn't mean okay, so I I, I think of my sin as trivial. No, my brothers. There are major sins and there are minor sins. Your minor sins get wiped out by prayer, fa- uh, fasting, hajj, umrah, juma, wudu, salat, sadaqah. But as for your major sins, the zina, the backbiting, the slandering, the oppression, the dhulm, and so on and so forth, all these big alcohol, all these big sins, they will not be wiped out by good deeds. A good deed can't wipe that out. It needs sincere repentance and tawbah, istighfar. And you know the conditions you have to meet for that. You have to first abandon the sin, stop it, close the, every door that le- led to that sin. That's the first thing. You abandon it, you stop it, and you close the doors that led to it. Second thing, you return the hug to the person you took, if you took that person hug, if you can do that. Thirdly, you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and vow never ever to go and do that again. These are the three main conditions for repentance to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah said in the Quran, Ya ibadi, alladina asrafu ala anfusihim, la taqnatu min rahmatillah, inna Allah yagfiru al-dunuba jami'an, inna ahu huwa al-ghafur rahim He said, O oh my worshippers, my slaves, my servants, do not despair in the mercy of your Lord, for indeed your Lord forgives all sins. He is the most forgiving. And He is the most merciful. So this is the Lord we have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Oh my slave, if your sins were to fill 
all the oceans, all the seas, and you would come to me and ask me alone for forgiveness and not ask anybody else, then I will give you just as much forgiveness as your sins. Condition is tawheed. Condition is worshipping Allah in oneness. Condition is having the correct aqidah. Condition is, is repenting sincerely, really from your heart. And then you can attain this forgiveness. So this month of Ramadan, my brothers, if you want to prepare it in any form or fashion, the best way to prepare for it right now is repentance. Making the wudu, praying in the last part of the night, opening the Quran, reading the Quran, pondering, thinking, turning to Allah, asking for forgiveness, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to enter this blessed month of Ramadan because there are many a people who will listen to talks, read books, even read Quran. But they won't get the ability to repent to Allah. Allah doesn't give it to them. Wallahi, I know brothers who complain to me, say to me, I can't repent. I say I want to, I want to, but I don't know how, I don't know what to do, or, or when I know what to do, I can't find the time to do it. Or if I don't find it, if it's not time, if it's, and I know how to do it, it's just obstacles in my way, and I can't condition my heart correctly, because I know if I repent, I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. This is at the state of the Ummah today. Many a Muslim brother have come to me and said this. But this is the time, my brothers, and this is why I read this, this ayah in the Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ Successful is the one who purifies himself from his sins through repentance. And remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ikhwani, <coughs> there is a hadith <coughs> in Sayyid Bukhari, and it's narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he said that verily, there is a piece of flesh in the body. If that piece of flesh in the body is pure, is sincere, is good, then the rest of the body, the whole of the body, every other limb and part of the body will be pure and good and righteous and upright. If that piece of flesh is poisoned or dark or evil, dirty, blackened, then the rest of the body will follow suit. The rest of the limbs will be as such. And then he said, is that piece of flesh not the heart? We know this hadith. Many of us have heard this hadith. Listen to Abu Hurairah, what he said in explanation of the hadith. He said, the heart is the king of the body. And the body parts, the limbs, are the soldiers. So if the king is good, then the soldiers will be good. If the king is wicked, then the soldiers then the soldiers will be alike. The king, my brothers, he the king he orders his army, his soldiers. He orders the body parts and the limbs. So if the king is upright then the soldiers will be upright. When the soldiers have miseries and disputes and problems and difficulties and hardships, they turn to their king and they ask for guidance. In, a, in an army or in a country. Likewise, if you reflect the bodily limbs, they do exactly the same thing. When you shed tears, you know, when you're sad, when you're upset, when you're weak and you can't move, your heart, you turn to your heart, you turn inwards, and you connect the heart with Allah, and you ask for guidance. You always turn to your heart for guidance, to help you get through. The heart is where the willpower is. The heart is where the determination is. The hope. All these are actions of the heart. Another thing to think about here is, you know, if we accidentally cut our fingers, we'll rush to the emergency hospital. You know, if we, oh, I've got a bad back, we'll rush to take the neurofen, the ibuprofen. You know, if um, anything happens to us, to our bodily limbs, we'll wrap it in bandage, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll take good care. Our mind will take good care of 
um, the bodily limbs. Even the, the heart will want you to wrap, go to the emergency, wrap the, the wound up, you know, take the neurofen. The heart will want you to do that. So the king wants for the limbs good. But do we ever see it the other way around? When the heart is sick, when the heart is ill, what do the bodily limbs do to rectify that heart? Do they pray in the middle of the night? Do the eyes wake him up at night and say, you better start praying? Hmm? Does the mind say to him, let's start fasting? Let's start reading Quran? It's important, my brothers, that we focus on our hearts and we condition our hearts and we rectify our hearts because if we rectify and condition our hearts then you will find your whole body will be rectified and you will draw closer to Allah. And then I will say that one of the best ways if you're looking for quick, easy way to rectify your heart and be in control of your heart being, and make your heart in control of your bodily limbs and your limbs to work for your heart it is to change your objective in life understand the purpose of your creation who you are what your position are where you are and then understand your Lord Allah and love Him more than anything in this world anything in this world if you can love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make Him your objective in life. More than your business. More than your wealth. More than your pastimes of sports, whatever it be. If you can make Allah more beloved to you than your wife, than your mother, than your children, And you strive to please Allah on a daily basis. Okay, but let me think now. What can I do today to please Allah? Let me think. I can do this. I can do that. And you strive that path to pleasing Allah. That Allah will be pleased with you. You just make one step to Allah. Allah will make seven towards you. You go walking to Allah. Allah will come running to you. You know the hadith. And this is what is required from us believers. Because when we start making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our objective in life, in this life, our main purpose of being here in this world, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fixes all of our affairs for us. And our hearts become pure and connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it controls our bodily limbs. But for many that's a hard thing to do. Going back to the Quran as I mentioned at the beginning of this reminder that we have to connect ourselves to the Quran. Let us take an example of our self, how they connected to the Quran. What kind of an effect the Quran had on them. So the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ عَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder over the Quran, contemplate over the Quran, or is their hearts locked? Answer that question to yourself, brothers. Is your heart open that when you read the Quran, that you can reflect and ponder and apply it to your life and make you realize, you know, I've got to be doing this, this, and that, and then changing it? Oh, let me do. Is it, a, is it a guide for you? Is it a handbook for you? Do you read it to understand it and ponder over it? And magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Glorify Him? Or is your heart locked? You don't even read the Quran. Or if you read the Quran, you read in Arabic, not interested in the meaning, not pondering over it. Because this was not the way of the Sahaba. This was not the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. When he taught the Quran to his companions, he taught them and he told them to contemplate over this. So the three generations after the companions, the companions, the next generation and the next generation, all these three generations, 
That's what they used to do. But now we come 1400 years ago, later, and we are, find maybe 1% of the Ummah is able to ponder over the Quran now. But back then, pondering, reflecting, understanding was more important than the ahkam, the rulings, to them. One of the Salafi said that we learned Quran, sorry, we learned Iman before we learned ahkam. Then when we sought ahkam, it increased us in our Iman. What he meant was we learned Iman first, we learned the Quran and made pondered over Allah, we learned our aqidah, we connected our hearts with Allah. Then we learned ahkam, wudu, salah, this, that. And when we learned these things, it increased us in our Iman. So my point is that this, the early companions, the first three generations, they are the ones who are our example. Maymun, Maymun bin Mahra, Mah, uh, Mahran, is the second generation. He was a writer and he had a son called Amr. He said to Amr, take me to Hassan al-Basri. Hassan al-Basri at the time was known for his speech, you know, beautiful, eloquent speech. They would say he had the speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning when he spoke, he spoke like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a very knowledgeable companion. And Amr asked him, why do you want to go to him for? He said, because I feel my heart has become hard. Maybe he can help me to soften my heart. So his son Amr took him there. And when he got there, he said to Hassan al-Basri, I feel hard. My heart is hard. Tell me what I should do. Should I fast? Should I pray at night? What shall I do? So Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, He said, I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed shaitan. And then he quoted an ayah from Surah Shu'ara, where in the meaning it said, if you see, when I leave them to live in this world, if you see when I leave these, the creation to live in this world, then comes to them that which they were promised. When Maimun heard this, he fell down and fainted. The ayah in the Quran said, when you see them that, you know, I, I, leave, I leave them to live in the world, carry on, eat, drink, you know, take the uh, the, 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 what have I provided for you? I give them the risk and sustenance and everything. When I leave them to this, then what comes to them is what, I, what was promised to them, what was written for them. If they're not good souls, their hearts become hard and they become wicked and evil and disobedient. But if their hearts are good, then it shuns evil and they get what is promised for them prayer, fasting, salat, wudu, etc., etc. Maimun, he understood what that meant and he fainted. That's how they used to ponder over the Quran. They would hear around the Quran, they'd apply it to themselves, this is about me, and they would faint. That's what they were like in the early days. Anas bin Malik, he said, a person who has lived the best life in this world, he will be brought on the day of judgment and he will be just dipped just once in the hell, in the hellfire. And he will be asked, have you ever known any luxury? Luxury? He will say, no, never. You know, so then Anna said, this is what I think Maimun understood from the verse. He was living a luxury life. And to them, you know, what we're living, we're living a far much luxury life than they used to live. But because whatever luxury he had, he felt that, subhanAllah, he's forgotten the hellfire. And he reminded him. This is the time, Ikhwani, to prepare ourselves. We know in this blessed month of Ramadan to come, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he opens all the gates of paradise. And he locks all the gates of hellfire. 
a hadith say Muslim in Bukhari. And all the shayateen, they're also locked up. Doing good deeds is going to become very easy. And this is why we see the masajid full in taraweeh. Because even the awam, the general people who don't pray five times a day, find it easy to pray in Ramadan. Because those big shayateen, what are holding them back, are now locked up. So it fill the masjid. Even you'll see them at Fajr. Why? Because they're waking up for suhoor, eating, and they'll come to the masjid Fajr and pray Fajr. And they'll fast all day. But this Ramadan is actually a training ground also to renew your iman, make that tawbah, make that istighfar, change your life. So when Ramadan finishes, you come out of it still praying five times a day, still praying Yaman Layl, and still fasting throughout the year. This is what it's supposed to do to us. Doing good deeds will be easy. Now what if you find yourself finding it difficult to make it to Taraweeh, to even fast, or read Quran, or pray at night, or do good deeds, giving sadaqah and so on and so forth, then that is a true gauge of what you are, where you are in your imam. In your imam, that's, that's, that's where you are. And so that's where we now we work on ourselves and we say, well, okay, now I can see where I am. Shayateen are locked up. The, door, the, the doors of, of heaven are open. Doing good deeds is easy. Doing uh, bad deeds is hard. And I'm still unable to do this, 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 and this. Now you can see the reality of your imam. So now you rectify we begin to fight our nafs and make that jihad against our nafs and ourselves and rectify ourselves. This is what we must do, my brothers. Jahidu bi amwalikum wa anfusikum dhalikum khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun. And struggle, strive with your wealth and yourselves. That is better for you if only you knew. What would we be? What type of human, what type of beings would we, we, we be? If we did not strive and rectify ourselves and fight our nafs on a daily basis, we would be like animals, like dogs and pigs, just consuming everything around us. But we're not that. I mentioned earlier about good deeds, that they wipe away bad deeds. In al hasanata yudhibna sayyat, dhalika dhikra li dhakirin. That verily, good deeds wipe out bad deeds. That is a reminder for those who take heed. Yes, these are your minor sins. Don't belittle your minor sins, my brothers. All of us carry minor sins. You know, the Sahaba, they used to say that you people, you think of your minor sins as a fly at the end of your nose, you just move it away and, and it goes away. Meaning you don't uh, give it any importance. But a believer... He looks upon his minor sins as if a mountain is about to fall on him. And do, does a mountain of sin just appear? No, it builds up, it builds up from little, little sins. Many of us might have mountains of minor sins around us and we don't even know. If you don't know that when you make wudu, that the sins, they drop off, are you done with your hands, they drop off? If you don't know that when you wipe your face with water making wudu, inside Muslim this hadith is, that the sins you commit with your eyes, they drop off. And when you clean your ears, the water drops off, the sins drop off with them. If you don't know that when you do raku, the sins you carry on your shoulders, they drop off. If you don't know that when you do sujood, and you ask Allah for forgiveness and make tasbih, the sins you, you have just stay on the floor. If you don't know these things, you won't get any of these things. You'll still be carrying your sins. Because why? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ Every action is judged by its intentions and every person shall get that which they have been promised, which they intended, sorry. They will get that which they intended. So when you do ruku and you don't intend for your sins to come off your shoulders and fall on the floor, you're not going to get it. 
When you do wudu and you're washing your hands, you're not thinking about, I want these sins I've done with my hands to, to go away. You're not going to get that. When you wash your face and wudu and you don't think that with these drops that are coming off, I want the sins that you know, I've done with my eyes to, to go away, clean my ears, I want to listen to haram. I want to clean my mouth, the lies and the cheating and the backbiting to fall off. You won't get none of that. This is why they import, it's so important to seek knowledge. So that you can attain these things. So this blessed month of Ramadan is the time where we must think about these things. Jazakallah khair. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu 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 wa salat